Yes? What is the difference between Title I and Title II? I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. What is the difference between Title I and Title II? Oh, type 1 is type 2. Okay, yeah. That, that causes a lot of confusion, doesn't it? Bipolar 1 and 2. Bipolar 1 are people who go back and forth between severe depressions and full-on manias, where they have all those symptoms I described where, with elated mood, irritable mood, grandiosity, decreased need for sleep, increased activity. But they also usually have severe impairment in their day-to-day -day life. So they end up getting arrested. They end up in the hospital or in jail or something, uh, losing their job, you can definitely see the impact of the mania on their behavior. People with bipolar two go back between depression and what we call hypomania. Hypomania is a less heightened, activated state. It's still above normal and you can still see it, especially if you're a family member. But if you met the person on the street, you might say, well, there's a person who talks a lot or fast, talks, walks fast or is full of ideas. But you wouldn't necessarily say they're psychotic or need to be in the hospital. And the difference is bipolar 2 is a more depressive type of the disorder. It's less destructive in the manic phases, but the depressions can be quite destructive. So even though you have, may have bipolar 2, you may still have some of the same needs treatment-wise as someone with bipolar 1. Yes? Uh, a little bit. We know very little about diet, to be honest. M many people have said that diet must play a role in it. It's not an obvious role in the sense that people who eat, uh, you know, gluten-free or something are are having fewer mood swings than those who don't. So, it, it, I would guess that anything that keeps you up at night, which might be caffeine, sugar, maybe too much protein, is going to interfere with your sleep and is going to interfere with your mood. But to be honest, there's not enough research on that to be able to say. Yes? Since we're addressing family approach, if you have bipolar, it's genetic. Your family members have a higher chance of having it. Can you tell us what that is on bipolar, my children, their children? Okay, so the question is about genetics. What does that actually mean when you have a genetic disorder? And I'm glad you're asking that because the actual risk to an offspring of someone with bipolar disorder is only about 10 or 15 percent. So the, now the population base rate is about 2 percent. So it is higher, but that's still low. Um, people who have kids, may, they may have a bipolar kid, they may have a kid who has some other disorder, but they may also have a healthy kid. And I, my feeling is if someone has bipolar disorder and they have a, a good partnership and they have the means to take care of a child, I think by all means. By the way, in Kate Jamison's book, she was told by a doctor, you, you shouldn't have children. That was one of her major points of anger with the uh, uh, psychiatric profession. Dave, we have a question all the way back there and then. Uh, back. Way back. back there oh, yes. To get attention. Is this all in the I, uh, the question is, is are, are there points in time you might come out of a long-term cycling pattern? And the answer is yes. There are people who seem to hit their 40s and 50s and their illness, for lack of a term, better term, mellows out. And we don't know why that is. It may be that they're doing fewer drugs. It may be that they're in a stable relationship and sleeping more regularly or having have their own kids and therefore keep to a more structured routine. But it does seem that the illness mellows with time. I won't say that we've seen people who just stop having episodes and never have another. But I've seen people who've gone five, ten years with no, no symptoms to speak of. And I've also seen people who've developed it at age 50 for the first time. That's very unusual, but it does happen. Somebody the whole way over there on the left. Yes, in the back. Would you order the top three or possibly top three or four or five? things to do to avoid uh, hospitalization for someone who has bipolar and, and what are the one being the most important? Okay, um, the first thing I would say is if you have a medication you're taking that's been effective in the past, stay on it. And that's, that's an if-then statement. So if, it's, you know, if they've been ineffective, then the answer is to try to get them changed. 
to something that is more effective. But if you've been taking lithium, for example, or Depakote and it's kept you stable, stay on it. Secondly, stay away from drugs and alcohol. And I mean entirely. Okay, a beer now and then. But people with bipolar disorder don't do well with daily marijuana or daily alcohol. They really don't. Uh, third, keep regular sleep-wake cycles and, re and regular daily routines. And fourth, get some psychotherapy. Yeah, oh, way in the back. Yeah, um, the question is, uh, can you, uh, if somebody's had multiple episodes and uh, then goes off medication and then is well, is that what you're saying? Over a 10 year period. Over a 10 year period. I have seen it happen where people go off their medications and they're okay. I think it's a high risk situation. If I were going through multiple hospitalizations and I were taking medicines and I had some evidence they were working, that they were the right medications, if I were really strongly wanting to go off of them, I would do it in a very systematic way. So for example, I might say, I'm going to meet with my doc on a weekly basis while I'm going off of them to make sure that I don't develop symptoms. I'm going to make sure people around me know what an episode looks like. I'm going to make sure I have an open dialogue with my doctor so I can get back in to get care again if I need medication. I wouldn't just go off of them and then disappear because to be honest, people who go off of their medications quickly have more relapses sooner, on average. But are there people who have been able to get along without medicine? Certainly there have. So you have some down here on the left, I think, Dave. Well, one with bipolar disorder, likely have to have psychotherapy for the lifetime? Do you need psychotherapy for the lifetime? No, not necessarily. What I usually recommend is people have, after their they've had a few episodes and they kind of know what the illness is like, have a therapy where, people, where the therapist goes through with you what the triggers have been, what the early warning signs are, what family relationships have played a role, uh, maybe get family members involved. What I think actually helps quite a bit are monthly check-ins. At some point, if you've had your therapy, you're stable, you're taking their medications, you've got a job and so on, you may not need weekly therapy. But a check-in is always a good idea. There's some, somebody who knows what you're going through and knows your history. And I have people who've been getting check-ins like that for years and years. Is it necessary? Not necessarily, but uh, people I think often like to because that's the one person who knows their history, if they can afford it. Yes, please. Sure, thanks. Uh, as a psychiatrist who prescribes medications and seen people over long periods of time, I think it could be really valuable if you can find a psychiatrist that's also interested in some therapy. Yeah. So when you go in for a session, the psychiatrist is very interested in things like your sleep-wake cycles and how you're handling stress and maybe gives some tips or coaching and is a, is a, gives a sympathetic gear instead of just writing the medication. And I think that's a nice model if you've had a, another therapist. Uh, so for example, if Dr. Miklowitz and I were working together, he might see the patient in the early stages and do family work or some more intensive work and then after a period of time, I sort of hand off the, the treatment, if you will, to a psychiatrist who could see the patient uh, monthly or even yep. ultimately uh, maybe every three months if everything's been stable for many years. But that's a nice model. And I, I, if I were a consumer, I'd be looking for that in a, in a psychiatrist. Yeah, that's a very good point. And, and I would add, too, that I think it's easy to assume that the, the doctor or the physician is going to be doing the medications and you've got to go somewhere else for your therapy. It may be the same person. And I think it's more certainly more economical if you can get the same from one person. But that isn't always possible. Somebody way back in the back there. Way in the back. Yeah. Sir. Connection between or resources showing connection between hormone levels and mood swings as far as like the patient being able to see physical changes that's coming on? Uh, hormonal changes. Are you talking about in teenage years or throughout the lifespan? Okay, throughout the lifespan. Certainly we see this in teenagers, that right after onset of pubescence, we see wide mood swings, particularly in girls, sometimes suicidal episodes for the first time, rumination, depression. 
When the, the other hormonal changes, and uh, uh, perhaps, perhaps Dr. Wright would comment on this as well, but uh, when women go through menopause, that's another time when we wonder about hormonal changes, triggering mood swings. Some, uh, particularly women, but men as well, have hypothyroidism, which can look an awful lot like depression. So there are a lot of people who go in to a doctor with what is assumed to be depression until their thyroid levels are checked and it turns out they're low thyroid. They take a thyroid supplement and their mood improves. Um, uh, there are people who have various endocrine problems, pituitary and so forth, that's less common. We also have, there are some women who develop uh, mood swings that are clearly uh, tied to their menstrual period. And uh, sometimes that's treated with a birth control pill. And, and, and no parent endocrine differences. Um, we see it. We, we see. Yeah, make a comment sure. Uh, yeah, we're we're learning more about the role of testosterone, particularly as uh, guys get older. And as an older white fellow uh, <laughs> with white hair and so forth, I tend to see a lot of older guys that come in, and we are often checking testosterone levels to see if that might play a role in low vigor, uh, uh, some problems in the sexual arena, or uh, even depression. But just to, coming back to this hormonal thing, just for a moment, uh, one of the ideas behind uh, interpersonal and social rhythms therapy, which uh, uh, Dr. McMahon would show a slide of how well that worked as a psychotherapy, uh, is really based on an idea about uh, regulating the daily rhythm of hormones, a circadian rhythm, which is a 24-hour rhythm. And it turns out that most of our hormones, like growth hormone and, and thyroid and male hormones and female hormones, uh, have a cycle throughout the day. And if you live a very regular life with regular sleep and wake times and meal times and maybe even exercise times, that circadian rhythm of hormones is very smooth. If you, could, you could track it during the day, you see it going up, coming down. If you have bipolar disorder, very irregular habits, it's all over the place like this. So the idea here is that somehow this is disrupting the biology that affects our moods and our sleep and other things. So it's a, it sort of goes back to the science of why a psychotherapy like interpersonal and social rhythms therapy might work. Uh, that's still somewhat theoretical. I think it's a very fascinating idea. Mm -hmm. Sure. Never hurts to get an endocrine workup. I think that's the, also the bottom line here. Yes, sir. Oh, <laughs> sorry. Blind to the front row. Do you ever see schizophrenia and bipolar disorder in the same family? I'm sorry, say that again. Do you ever see do I ever see schizophrenia and bipolar at the same time? Uh, you can't actually co-diagnose them at the same time. You said in the same family. Oh, in the same family. Yes. Uh, actually, it's an interesting question you're asking because there is now thought to be a higher genetic uh, shared commonality between bipolar disorder and schizophrenia. Almost 40% of the genes for bipolar disorder are also present in people with a family history of schizophrenia. You still see many more people with mood disorders, both bipolar and unipolar in the family tree than you do people with schizophrenia. What I see more of are people who have bipolar disorder with psychotic episodes. So they aren't schizophrenic per se, but they have episodes of depression or mania where they have delusions and hallucinations that look schizophrenic and sometimes they're misdiagnosed. There's a question way in the back. A gentleman's been trying to get yes. a uh, question answered. Yes, the question is about socioeconomical differences, cultural differences, I assume you mean as well. Um, the incidence of bipolar disorder appears to be fairly similar across cultures and socioeconomic strata. So if you look, if you actually use, the, the World Health Organization did a study on this recently where they actually used an instrument that they translated into multiple languages and they found very similar rates in Asia and in Africa and so forth. What is different though, is that the course of psychiatric illnesses are sometimes better in third world countries. Why would that be? Why would it be that uh, someone who lives in Africa or India might do better? The theory is that they have less stress 
and they may have more family connections, or more, more of a sort of a family context uh, for taking care of them, even if they may not be, have access to the best medications. Um, on the other hand, I recently worked with a psychiatrist from Nairobi who uh, told me that in uh, the rural parts of, of Kenya, uh, people are treated all the time with phenobarbital, which is a very old medication we used to use primarily as a kind of anti-anxiety agent. But you wouldn't use that for bipolar disorder, but they use it there quite a lot. So is the treatment the same? I doubt it. 